All right, in this video, I would like to talk about uh, animal viruses, um, eukaryotic viruses in general, but for the most part, for us, that means animal viruses. Um, in fact, all sorts of eukaryotes have viruses. There are plant viruses, there are fungal viruses, there are probably some protozoal viruses, although I can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, but um, in this class, what we're mostly focused on is, is viruses that have some potential application to humans uh, in causing disease. So if this were a class that was more devoted towards microbial ecology, we might talk more about plant or fungal viruses, but for our purposes as a pre-medical class, um, that's mostly what we're going to focus on. So um, the first thing that I want to talk about is how viruses are classified. So for bacteriophages, um, we talked about how uh, they're classified as uh, uh, virulent or uh, temperate uh, or also filamentous phages, although we didn't really talk about those very much. You know, for animal viruses, there are a couple of different ways that they can be classified. Um, you can classify them based off of their genomic structure. So viruses can be DNA or RNA. They could be single-stranded or double-stranded. And if they're single-stranded RNA, which a lot of them are, they can be what are called either positive sense or negative sense, which just means that, like, if it's positive sense, then the ribosome can just get started on it right away. If it's negative sense, then you have to make a copy of it before the ribosome can get on it. You can also classify viruses based off of their particle structure, uh, basically what shape is their uh, capsid. And there's a bunch of different shapes. I'm going to show you a bunch of them on the next slide. Uh, by the presence or absence of the envelope. Uh, and if you'll recall, an envelope is a lipid membrane that surrounds some viruses, but not all. And viruses can be uh, uh, also classified by the presence or absence of spikes. So just to give you uh, some examples of the great diversity of viruses that you find uh, that infect animals, uh, here we have uh, a naked isometric virus. Naked means that it doesn't have an envelope. Isometric means, if we go in here, you see this sort of regular shape here where uh, it has, uh, it looks kind of like a, if any of you play Dungeons and Dragons, it looks kind of like a 20-sided die. It's a multi-sided structure. It could have eight sides, it could have six sides, uh, it could have 10 sides or 20 sides, but it has a regular number of sides. All the sides basically look the same. That's isometric. Um, and that's a very common way that viruses can look. Let me get this back in here. Uh, you can have some viruses that are bullet shaped. So uh, notably the rabies virus is bullet shaped where they have sort of a flat edge and then they go off towards a curved edge there. Uh, you can have a filamentous virus. Uh, with a filamentous virus, usually you have like the proteins are sort of stacked in a helix, and so they're sometimes called helical viruses as well. Uh, but basically they wrap up into this thing that makes a tube, and that tube is really, really long and looks kind of like a filament. Hence, filamentous. Uh, here you see, so this was isometric and, and naked. This one is isometric and enveloped. Um, this one here is, uh, is an enveloped virus with protein spikes around the outside. This is, in fact, our friend coronavirus, uh, which is mostly like pleomorphic because it doesn't really have a well-contained capsid. Uh, what it does have is, is basically a, um, a genome that's been wrapped in some proteins that then is then wrapped in an envelope, and then the envelope has all of these protein spikes coming out of it, and that's, this is the crown, corona means crown, uh, surrounding it. Uh, you can have some 
viruses that are hmm, go to the next page here um, that are isometric and have spikes coming out of them. Um, they can be uh, enveloped and brick shaped. And this is by no means all of the shapes. By the way, don't memorize these. Don't like go through this table and like go, oh, I need to memorize that hepadnaviridae is a lip is a lipid containing envelope with a isometric caps. No, don't do that. I just want you to generally be familiar with the fact that animal viruses come in many shapes. And like some of those shapes are isometric or filamentous or bullet shaped. Don't memorize which one is which. That they can have an envelope or not have an envelope. They can have spikes or they cannot have spikes. All right, that's good. So that's the second way that you can classify uh, viruses is, is based on their shape. Um, and so like you can usually put all of these things together. So you might describe a virus as being a, a single stranded RNA positive sense virus uh, that's isometric and enveloped with spikes um, and infects humans. And they're also often named for the disease that they cause. Uh, so, um, when you, what happens when you get infected by a virus? So viruses are interesting in that as opposed to bacteria, most bacteria are not pathogenic at all. Uh, most bacteria want absolutely nothing to do with you. If they found themselves inside of you, they wouldn't just like panic and die. Um, viruses, all viruses are pathogenic to some extent. Um, if they are human viruses, then they are pathogenic to humans. So these are like exclusively infection-causing agents. And what happens when an infection occurs can be various. Like some things are going to infect you and then kill you uh, pretty quickly, and some things are going to infect you and then you probably won't even notice that you have them ever in your life. And uh, what happens when you get infected depends on a lot of different factors. Um, some of them, the more virulent viruses, are going to uh, uh, you know, cause disease and start replicating. A lot of them are actually just never going to produce disease, if by disease what we mean is the manifestation of visible symptoms. Um, many viruses, like we are all infected by hundreds or thousands of viruses. And a lot of them, basically, your immune system suppresses them most of the time. And so you will like maybe constantly have a few viruses being made. But for the most part, even though they're infecting your cells, they're kept suppressed. And this is called balanced pathogenicity. This is when... You know, you're infected by a virus, for the most part, it just stays dormant. And maybe every so often it'll come back out, um, cause you a few problems, then go away. This is very normal. For instance, there are um, hundreds, uh, potentially thousands of different uh, what are called uh, papillomaviruses that humans have. It's like whole bunches of them. And papillomaviruses cause warts. And you're, like, infected with a bunch of these things. They're permanent. You don't get rid of them. They last forever. Um, but you aren't covered in warts all the time because your immune system keeps them suppressed for the most part. And sometimes they might come out when you're sick or something like that or, or when something happens to release them or when you're stressed. Uh, this is much the same with herpes viruses, right? So herpes has, uh, in total, about... 80% of sexually active adults, actually just 80% of adults in general, are uh, positive for some form of herpes. Uh, HSV-1 or HSV-2. For the most part, you probably have herpes. And you probably will never be inconvenienced by it. Almost everyone gets it. 
For most people, they might have a breakout when they first get it, and then it goes away. Except it doesn't really go away. It just hides. And it can come out later on when you're sick. If you've had cold sores or fever blisters, these are outbreaks of usually the herpes virus uh, because your immune system is busy dealing with some other infection that you have, and so herpes is going to pop back out and go, hey, still here. Uh, and then as soon as you get better, you clear up the herpes, and it's, it's like, annoying. Some people will have repeated outbreaks on a regular basis. It depends on the person, their immune system, the specific strain of herpes that they got, whole bunch of other things. Um, but there are a bunch of diseases that work this way, uh, viruses that work this way, that permanently infect you and you have them for the rest of your life, but for the most part, they just never manifest. So that is balanced pathogenicity. Of those viruses that infect you and do manifest symptoms, uh, we divide them into generally two categories, acute and persistent. Acute means you get it, you get sick, and then you either get better or you get die. And when you get better, you don't have it anymore. It's not there. It doesn't stick around. Influenza is a classic acute viral disease. You get sick, or you get infected, I should say. Then a couple of days later, you get sick, and then you either die or you get better. And then once you get better, you don't have influenza anymore. It's gone. Your body cleared it up. Persistent infections mean that you get infected and maybe you don't get sick right away. Maybe you do get sick right away. But then you get better, but the virus stays around. There's a few different modes of things being uh, persistent, but basically a persistent viral infection is one where you get it and then you're going to have it for a long time, probably for the rest of your life. Let's talk about acute infections first. This is probably the thing most of us think of when we think of getting sick. All right? They typically are short duration, which for some of them can mean weeks to months but probably not years or decades. Um, generally, the host develops long-lasting immunity, though not always, uh, and they result in what are called productive infections, which means that your body produces a large number of viruses throughout the course of the disease that can go on to infect other people. Um, the disease symptoms can result from tissue damage, infection of new cells, or also very frequently can the disease symptoms can result from your own immune system basically raising the alarms and going to war. A classic acute infection is measles. Right? So you get infected with measles. There's a um, asymptomatic period while the measles virus is like infecting your cells and sort of preparing to replicate and things like that. And then you have a period of increasing what's called viral load, which is like if you were to measure the amount of viruses present in somebody's blood or other body fluids, you have an increasing viral load until eventually your viral load gets high enough that it produces symptoms. And then you will typically develop an immune response against it, and the disease begins to go away, usually with the viral load dipping first, and then the symptoms going away following that. And then once you get to the end, you have an effective defense against it. You are no longer vulnerable to it. Um, and then it's gone. So acute infections are not the same as the lytic cycle in phages, but you're going to see some similarities here. They act kind of similar to the lytic cycle, uh, to lytic bacteria phages, right? With acute infections, usually the virus invades, it replicates, it blows up the cell, 
it spreads, releasing a whole bunch of offspring, and then they infect new cells, and then they replicate, and they destroy the cell, and then they spread, and then they, and it's very aggressive, very fast, very quick. Uh, and there are some other steps here, but a lot of these steps are going to be very similar to the lytic cycle. So the first step, again, is attachment. Um, and with attachment, just like with bacteriophages, this is what determines the specificity. Both species specificity and the cell type specificity. Uh, so, for instance, um, COVID. Right? Specifically, and in fact, um, all of the, uh, the, the, uh, the SARS type coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, COVID, um, they all uh, attach through means of their spikes to uh, human ACE receptors or ACE2 receptors, angiotensin converting enzyme. Uh, uh, type 2 receptors. And these are receptors that are found on some cells, but not others. They're found um, in very high numbers in uh, the back of your nose, uh, somewhat smaller numbers in your throat, um, in relatively small numbers in your lungs. Uh, but they're also found on uh, your vasculature throughout your body, your blood vessels. And COVID can infect any cell that expresses these ACE2 receptors. Uh, cells that don't express ACE2 receptors, like say neurons, cannot be infected by COVID. But any cells that it can attach to, it can infect, in theory. So we have attachment, entry, and there's a couple of different ways of entry, uh, depending upon whether the virus is enveloped or not. Uh, if the virus is enveloped, one way that it can get in is through fusion. Uh, and in fusion, what happens is it docks very close to the cell membrane, and then the cell membrane merges with the viral envelope, which is basically similar to a cell membrane. Kind of similar to if you see two soap bubbles collide and they just blurt into one big soap bubble. And when the membranes merge, the naked virus particle is released inside the cell. Uh, another very common way is through endocytosis. In this case, the virus is going to attach to receptors on the cell and it will activate those receptors and try to convince the cell that the virus is in fact something that the cell wants. There are lots of things that your cells want and the way that they get them inside is through endocytosis. They basically bring in this bubble of membrane containing whatever it is that they want. So the virus will pretend to be something else, will pretend to be something that uh, the, the cell wants, and then the cell is going to welcome it inside through endocytosis, and once the virus is inside, it will pop the vesicle surrounding it and release itself to the rest of the cell. Uh, there are many different sites in a uh, eukaryotic cell. And for some of them, it's just going to be replicating in the cytoplasm. That's probably the most common, is you release, you know, your genetic material, and it just starts making proteins in the cytoplasm. But there are a lot of viruses that target themselves to the nuclei or to other parts inside of the cell. So the, the virus particle is going to go off to wherever it needs to be to replicate, and then it uncoats. Now, this is something you don't see in, uh, uh, in, in bacteriophages because remember in bacteriophages, the coat is left outside of the cell because of the cell wall. Animal cells don't have cell walls. So when uh, the virus is welcomed inside, right, the whole virus particle, coat and all, is welcomed inside. And it's going to have to shed its coat before it can do really anything. So uncoating is a step. 
Then you have replication of the nucleic acid and synthesis of the proteins, very similar to the lytic phase. Um, maturation. Maturation is what we call assembly because with animal viruses, it sometimes includes steps other than just putting the thing together. Like often um, there is a, a some modification of the genome has to happen or the proteins have to be cut in a particular way. But basically what it means is assembling a viral particle. And that's what maturation is. It's pretty much the same as assembly. Then you have cell lysis. The cells are released and they can either be released like all at once where the cell just pops and a whole bunch of viruses are freed. This is very common with naked viruses. Um, or lysis can happen a little bit slower where you have like a cell and the cell has just lots of viruses constantly bubbling out of it. And this is still going to result in lysis because each of these viruses is carrying away some membrane with it. And eventually the cell will not have enough membrane to sustain itself and the cell will just burst and die. Um, and this is more common with enveloped viruses. Now, uh, whether it happens all at once or slowly over time, uh, you get cell lysis and release of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the viruses. And because animals are multicellular creatures, this isn't the end. You now have the viral disorder spreading within the host from one cell to another to another and spreading outside of the host. Uh, spreading outside of the host is technically called shedding. And then transmission to the next host, infection. Uh, here is uh, the process of a enveloped virus emerging. So you can see here, this is the naked virus particle, and it goes to the membrane, which is usually going to, by this point, be full of viral spike proteins. Uh, and on its way out, it's going to pick up some of that membrane with the viral proteins on it, and then become separated. So that was acute infections. Next, we have persistent infections. And there are three basic modes for persistent infections, latent, chronic, and slow. Latent infections are quite common. With latent infections, what you have is the virus infects you, you get sick, and then you get better but your immune system hasn't totally gotten rid of the virus. The virus has just hidden out somewhere where your immune system can't get at it. Uh, and later on, it can reactivate, either in the same form or in a different form. Uh, the herpes virus family is famous for producing latent infections. And a classic latent infection is chickenpox, also known as herpes zoster. So the chickenpox virus is called zoster, and it is a herpes type virus. Many of you may have had chickenpox at some point in your life. You get infected, and then similar to a uh, acute infection, you get infected, you begin producing virus particles, you begin expressing symptoms, and then your immune system learns how to fight it, and you start suppressing the virus particles. But it doesn't go away. In fact, the, the zoster virus hides out inside of your nerve ganglia uh, next to your spinal cord. And while they're inside there, your immune system can't really get at them. But they can't get out as long as your immune system is vigilant. So you could go months, years, decades with 
without experiencing any symptoms. But at some point in the future, you can start remaking virus particles. And this will usually happen um, spontaneously. And generally speaking, when it happens, your immune system just pounces on them and they die. Uh, but if your immune system is weakened or distracted by something, then these reactivated virus particles can begin infecting cells along the nerve where they reemerge. And they will usually not reemerge all over your body. So uh, when chickenpox reactivates, we call the reactivated form shingles. And usually it's not going to happen all over your body. It's just going to happen along the path of one spinal nerve. Uh, and it will produce sort of similar symptoms to chicken pox. Painful, itchy, red blisters. And you'll have this shingles infection for a while, and then your immune system will hopefully eventually get it back under control and suppress it. And then... It will go away for weeks, months, years, and could then come back. Um, the uh, uh, Another example of a latent infection is herpes simplex 1 and 2. This is the more common herpes virus, uh, and it infects mucous membranes, usually around the lips, with the genitalia, causing blisters, and then it'll go away. Except it's not really gone. It's just hanging out inside of your nerves. Uh, and if you get sick sometime later on, it can reemerge, the symptoms reemerge, and then it'll clear up. And every so often, it'll come back and just go, hey, still here. And, uh, and you'll have it for the rest of your life. Most of the time, won't ever bother you. Most people who get herpes just get one outbreak and then it goes dormant pretty much forever for the rest of their life but it always has the potential to reemerge because it is still latent in there the second type is chronic infections with a chronic infection the virus is constantly present in the body uh, actively being produced as opposed to with latent infections if, if you have if you were infected with chicken pox as a kid and I was to go look at your blood right now I would not be able to find any chicken pox uh, I would probably not be able to find any chicken pox virus present in your blood all right it doesn't produce the 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 virus until it reactivates with a chronic infection, you are constantly producing high levels of the virus. Now, you might not have high levels of symptoms the whole time. But uh, a classic chronic infection is hepatitis B. Uh, if you get infected with hepatitis B, you start producing hepatitis virus and it reaches a plateau level, and then it's just always there. And, you know, a week later, you can go and test somebody's blood. Yep, still hepatitis virus present. A year later, you can go and look at their blood, and yep, still hepatitis virus pre present. Now, it doesn't have immediate symptoms, so you probably, like, you can detect the virus. You might feel totally fine. It's still doing constant damage to you. It's doing constant damage to your liver, which is a place where you can't see very well. And so over time, the course of weeks to months to years, the damage to your liver builds up until eventually you begin to manifest symptoms because your liver has suffered so much damage that you go into liver failure. Um, so even though the, the symptoms of the disease happen slowly over time, the virus is always present, and the virus is always present at high levels. So that's a key point with chronic infections. You're constantly producing virus. This is contrasted with 
the third mode or of slow infections. The classic slow infection is HIV. And with HIV, you get infected. There might actually be a brief spike very early on uh, of virus production. We're looking at the amount of virus present in the blood here. But then it goes away. And then over the course of years, you start off with no virus present in your blood, and then over time, you start to get a little bit of virus present, and then more, and then more, and then more, until over the course of years, you eventually reach a very high level of virus being present, and symptoms will show up sometime around, you know, when you have a lot of virus present in your blood. Uh, so retroviruses, most well-known HIV, tend to cause slow infections, as do prions. And prions, of course, are not viruses. They're infectious proteins, and they don't... So you wouldn't have viruses present in your blood. But they exhibit the same sort of motif, where you get infected, and you start off with basically no prion proteins present in your brain, and then slowly, over time, you get a few more, a few more, a few more, building, building, building. So I have a couple of special topics that I want to cover. Um, first off, uh, what are called viral genetic alterations. So every year, there's a cold and flu season. And every year, like, even if you had a cold last year, you could get another cold this year. In fact, you could get two colds this year. You could get three colds this year. There's a whole bunch of colds you could get this year. Um, there's also a flu every year. Actually, there's usually two or three flus every year. And even if you got the flu vaccine last year, you could still get the flu again this year. And um, what does that mean? Does that mean that the flu vaccine isn't very good? Not exactly. It's actually a pretty good vaccine. So why are there these diseases that you can get over and over and over again when other things like chicken pox or measles or whatever, you can only get once? So with colds, it's actually because cold is not a virus. Cold is not a disease. Cold is just the name of a set of symptoms. There are actually over a hundred different viruses that cause the common cold, not just one. And so if you get a cold this year and then you get a cold next year, chances are they're totally different colds. They just have similar symptoms or even not so similar symptoms. So there probably won't ever be a good uh, vaccine for the cold because because there's not just one thing. It's like a hundred things. Are you gonna get a hundred shots to prevent you from getting the cold? Probably not. Getting the cold isn't all that nasty. Um, so you're probably not gonna get vaccinated a hundred times for it. It's just not feasible. And certainly no one is going to develop a hundred different vaccines to get rid of the cold. But what about influenza? Is that the same case? Are there a hundred different flus out there? No, there's just one sort of, one family of influenza virus. It, however, does have a whole bunch of different strains, but usually only a couple of them are dominant at any one time. Uh, the strains of influenza are defined by two proteins, uh, the H protein and the N protein. Uh, which is the, uh, uh, if you've ever, like if you recall, uh, swine flu from back in the day, that was H1N1. So there are a bunch of different variants of this H protein and a bunch of different variants of this N protein that can be combined in different ways. And the reason why, even though you got a flu vaccine last year, 
you probably need to get a flu vaccine again this year is because the flu changes every year. And there are two mechanisms by which it can change. Mutation and genetic reassortment. Mutation is usually called genetic drift. It accumulates a, a few small changes that slightly alter its proteins. Usually doesn't result in a shift from like N1 to N5 or anything like that. It stays N1 or it stays N3 or whatever it is. Um, but it changes a bit. And uh, when that happens, that means that your antibodies, your vaccination against it, don't work as well. But they probably still work okay. So if the virus just drifted from last year, like if you got a flu shot last year, you probably don't absolutely have to get a flu shot again this year because you probably still have some level of residual protection. Even though it changed a bit, it just changed a bit, so you still have some protection. You know, if you're a fairly young, healthy person, it's not a big thing to worry about. If you're older or you know, compromised or something like that, then yes, it would be something to worry about because you probably didn't have very good protection to begin with. Drift happens every year, all the time. Drift is always happening. Um, it's just normal mutation. But sometimes, not every year, but some years, you get what's called genetic shift. Genetic shift happens when you have two different strains of the virus. Say we're talking about the influenza virus here, right? Say you had two different strains of it. Maybe you have H5N3 and you have H2N1, all right? Uh, and they both infect the same cell at the same time. First off, whoever this poor bugger is is in for a bad weekend because he, uh, he, has, he, does, he has double flu, right? He has two different strains of the flu at the same time. It's not going to be fun for him. <clears throat> but because the two strains of the flu are genetically very similar, they're both the flu, so they're both have the same genes and most of the same genetic code, they can do what's called crossing over. This is the same type of crossing over that happens in your own cells during meiosis, if you remember that process. Basically, what this allows them to do is to swap genes with one another. And that means that what comes out on the other side might be H5N1. And that's different. That's totally new. All right? You got H5N3 infected you. H2N1 infected you, but H5N1 came out. And when a genetic shift happens, probably like any immunity that you might have had from having the flu shot last year or from having the flu last year or anything like that, all that's now thrown out the window. What you got is a new strain of flu. And this H5N1 is going to get out there and it's, it's nobody's going to have much protection from it. They actually are going to have some protection from it because you've had flus before, you've had flu vaccines before, so you will still have some residual protection against it, but you'll have a lot less than you normally would. Uh, genetic uh, shift, antigenic shift like this is one of the big things that creates bad flu years. Uh, in fact, it's one of the main mechanisms that makes pandemic flu. Uh, H1N1 was the result of such a shift. Um, the pandemic flu from uh, the uh, late 60s, early 70s was the result of 
uh, genetic shift, and we believe that the 1918 Spanish flu was also the result of a genetic shift. Um, and there are normal seasonal flus that can result from a genetic shift as well. Uh, and those are usually going to be bad flu years where a lot of people are going to get it, and where people who get it are going to be much more likely to die. Now I want to sort of briefly go over other infectious agents. Um, so non-cellular, not bacteria or stuff like that, uh, but also not viruses. And there's a couple of other things that could exist, uh, that do exist. Um, they're usually pretty rare and arguably, are they alive? Probably not. Are they microbes? I think that you might be able to, to, like, even people like me who have a very broad definition of microbes would be a little bit hesitant to classify these as microbes. Um, and the first one that I want to talk about, one that I'm going to spend the most time talking about, is prions. Prions are proteins. Just proteins, no DNA, no genome. They aren't even like big complex proteins. They're just like normal proteins. But they are capable of infecting you and causing disease. And you can then infect other people. It's not easy, but it's possible. Um, and actually, uh, I, I lied a little bit there because prions are normal proteins. Everyone has prions. I have prions. You have prions. All mammals have prions in their brain. We all have, it's a normal protein for us to make. When we talk about prion disease, what we're talking about is misfolded prions. So we all have normal, well-folded, prions in our brains. They're, they seem to be important to the function of our brains for some reason, which is actually not very well understood, but they're present in everyone's brains. And as long as they are well folded, there's no problem. The problem comes from if you have a misfolded prion. This misfolded prion has this, like, big area that's wrong. And normally your proteins are folded so that they have their hydrophobic, water-hating regions inside where they don't have to be near any water. But now this big water-hating region is exposed. So this misfolded prion protein is going to sidle on up next to a normal prion protein. And what it does is it nudges. It actually kind of worms its way in there, kind of like a cat trying to get under your hand and force you to pet it, All right? And it will nudge in there and force this other prion protein to adopt the same configuration that it has to misfold in exactly the same way. And now you have two misfolded prion proteins that are going to both go off their separate ways and convert two more. So you start with one bad prion protein, and then it creates another, and now you have two, and those two 
then go off and make another, and now you have four, and then eight, and then 16, and eventually you have millions upon millions upon millions of these misfolded prion proteins, and they begin to conglomerate together in large masses called plaques that disrupt your brain cells and disrupt your neural function. They break apart your neurons from being able to talk to each other, and they'll actually start to kill your neurons as well. Um, and this doesn't happen quickly, right? It happens very, very slowly, which is why prion diseases are considered to be a slow infection. Um, now, is this actual replication? Well, not exactly, right? There's no DNA or genome being replicated. This protein isn't making more proteins. It doesn't code for more proteins. What it kind of does is more like conversion. Sort of like, I like to think of them as zombies, right? So, you know, with a zombie, in order to get new zombies, mommy zombie and daddy zombie don't share a special hug and baby zombie comes along. It's not the way it works, right? You have a zombie, goes and finds a normal person, ah, munch, 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 eats their brains. Now the normal person becomes new zombie. And then they both go off and they find more people and they convert those people into zombies and so on and so forth. And in fact, brain eating comes into this thing uh, because these are brain proteins. These prion proteins occur in the brain. So how would you get infected with it? Well, to get infected with it, you have to get somebody else's brain in your body. And that doesn't happen very often. Usually the way you're going to get somebody else's brain in your body is if you eat it. So basically, you have to eat somebody else's brain, probably eat somebody else's brain, uh, in order to get this, uh, uh, this prion infection. And they're very, very rare. They've actually been fairly few uh, cases of this. But it can cross uh, species. It's very rare for it to cross species, but it does happen. So there's a, uh, an agent, uh, uh, a disease in sheep, called scrapie, which is a prion disease, and it causes scrapie spongiform encephalopathy, um, which, which means that encephalopathy means brain disease, spongiform means makes your brain look like a sponge. Uh, and uh, this has been in sheep for a long time. And then we eventually started to see... Um, the same thing happened in cows, and this is called mad cow disease, or mad cow spongiform encephalopathy. And we believe that it got into cows because we would take basically the parts of sheep that nobody wanted to buy and eat, which was largely the brain and stuff like that, and you grind them all up into this thing called offal, and then you feed it to other animals. So you feed some of this disease sheep bring to cows, the cows get the disease, and then you take the cow offal and you feed it to other cows, and that's how it spreads from cow to cow, because cows don't eat other cows very often. Um, and then it spread into humans, and what's called uh, new variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And there was a very, very tiny epidemic of this in, like, the 90s, uh, mostly in the UK. And we believe it was linked to people uh, eating beef that had been tainted with neural tissue. Maybe one cow's brain fell into the ground beef vat or something like that. Um, and... Uh, and a few of these humans caught mad cow disease from these cows. And the technical term for it is Kreutzfeldt-Jakob. Uh, there are also other uh, diseases out there. Um, so chronic wasting disease in deer and elk. Uh, transmissible mink agent in minks. Uh, are other animals that have similar prion disorders. There's actually a native human prion disorder as well called kuru, um, which exists in... Uh, it was in some small 
community. I believe it was a native Pacific Islander community. Uh, maybe Papua New Guinea, but I'm not certain. Uh, but they practiced ritualized cannibalism. And, uh, you know, part of that was eating other people's brains. Uh, and so that's how it was passed from person to person among these. Like, really, the only way that these diseases get passed from one agent to another is by eating neural tissue. So they don't really exist that much in the wild. Because for the most part in the wild, uh, things don't eat the brains of other things that are the same species as themselves for exactly this reason. So that, because it's not healthy to engage in cannibalism because you could catch something from it. Like most things that infect, say, like cows don't infect humans. It's very difficult for humans to catch disease from cows. But it's very easy for humans to catch disease from humans. So it's a bad idea to go around eating other humans. It's just not very hygienic. Uh, here you can see this is your brain. This is your brain on prions. Um, it basically, like, eats big holes in it. And uh, mostly, it actually starts off affecting the um, neuromusculature system, the motor control portion of the brain. So you start by losing control of your muscles and you start to shake. Kuru actually means the shakes. Uh, and, um, and then you start to have like seizure-like disorders and... Um, your brain begins to have trouble processing information. You begin to have cognitive functions, memory loss, uh, drowsiness, um, unexplained emotional shifts, things like that. Uh, yes, here's prions. Just talked about that. Viroids. Uh, viroids are an infectious agent that is just nucleic acid. In fact, it's just RNA. No protein, no DNA. It doesn't encode any proteins either. All it does is it's a piece of RNA that says to the cell, make more copies of this RNA. And the cell will make so many more copies of that RNA that it uses up all of its energy doing that. Uh... Viroids are very uncommon in animals. Uh, viroids are more common in plants. Uh, so we're not going to talk about them very much, but you should know that they are infectious RNA. Uh, yeah. So all identified viroids infect plants. They can be very important for agriculture, uh, but less important for medicine. All right. Thus concludes our discussion of viruses.